Hello there. How's everybody doing? I'm back here with another video, and thank goodness it didn't take me damn near like three weeks to make this time. First of all, I wanted to personally thank you all for the heartwarming comments on my last video. I'm actually doing pretty well, so uh, you don't have to worry about me too much. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of uh, underestimated how accommodating and very well behaved this community is, because when I looked into the comments, there was nothing but love, and the overall sentiment was something like, We don't care what type you are. We're here for you. If I knew you in real life, I would give you all the Ben and Jerry's mint chocolate cookie ice cream in the world. Leave Mr. Mystic alone. He didn't know any better. He was just trying his best. He's just trying to make a point. He loves pupusas. But uh, in other <laughs> but in other news, some people were starting to second guess their type, and I suppose it's because there's some overlap between the INFJ and the ISFJ, such that it causes confusion. So actually, let me attempt to settle down that confusion for you all. And let me preface by saying that I'm more ISFJ than INFJ. And if I'm really generous with myself, I think it's like an 85-15 ratio here. And uh, this video will explain everything. And I took a few notes on what other people said about this comparison. And I also derived ideas from my own experiences conversing with INFJ and ISFJ acquaintances. And with all that being said, I'm giving you all this to the best of my knowledge, and I encourage you to do your own research on the topic as well. And uh, I put some resource links in the description so that you could start there. So yeah, uh, with all that, let's begin. <music> Before we discuss the differences between the ISFJ and the INFJ, we'll need to address one thing, and that is the question about sensing versus intuition. You see these words over here? Okay, good, good. Vamos! This is why people have an identity crisis in the first place. We need to acknowledge that we have both sensing and intuition, and we have a pretty good capacity for both. And this leads me into confusion one. How does an ISFJ incorporate intuition into their lives? And how does an INFJ incorporate sensing? An ISFJ using intuition, particularly introverted intuition, is like looking at the view of Seattle from the top of the Space Needle. The Space Needle represents a vivid past memory or a familiar idea, while the view from the Space Needle represents the landscape of different options that the ISFJ can explore. Put it another way, an ISFJ's introverted sensing is like the safety of a home, while introverted intuition is like the many possible places that they can go to, provided that they can come back home. When an ISFJ uses NI to explore anything different, they will tend to use an anchor of familiarity provided by SI, so that they can use it as a reference point to relate the novel concept to. The way I see it, the strength of an ISFJ's NI depends on how far they are able to stray from the anchor of familiarity without feeling an inkling of discomfort, and they can go surprisingly far. If ISFJs develop their extroverted intuition, their underutilized function, because it works in tandem with their extroverted feeling as well as their introverted sensing, this will give them the quality of, let's say, a great leader. An INFJ incorporating sensing, particularly introverted sensing, is like taking all of the millions of ideas in their head and then figuring out how to compartmentalize them into neat categories. Imagine going into like, I don't know, freaking Home Depot or something, and then you go into the nuts and bolts section, and there's like a metric fuck ton of stuff that will make your head spin. But then when you inspect closely, all these items are actually arranged in so many categories. There's an underlying method to this madness, and I think this is what an INFJ's use of introverted sensing to give their NI a sense of clarity will look like. If an INFJ develops their extroverted sensing, their underutilized function, because it works in tandem with their extroverted feeling and introverted intuition, 
This will help them understand that the minute details and the monotonous chores actually contribute to their grandiose visions of the future, and it will help them become more reliable than they already are when working with other people. Confusion number two. Both the ISFJ and the INFJ will have introverted thinking, but they will explore their ideas in a different manner. I saw a comment that captures this perfectly, and uh, if I find it, then I will put it here. Now, uh, let me see if I can reiterate this. Their introverted thinking will be supplemented by their respective dominant function. For the ISFJ, it's SI. For the INFJ, it's NI. So if you want to know the difference, you want to pay special attention to how they form their point. An ISFJ will tend to favor a more story-like progression of their thought processes, and their logical progression will unravel itself at the same time. They will give themselves time to set up the foundation of their ideas, and then they will take you along their journey as they build up from there. When you listen to an ISFJ speak, you'll tend to be a little let's say impatient because they will take a while to get to their point and then you'll be like, where is this going? But your patience will actually pay off because once you get their point, you'll all of a sudden understand every other point that led up to the crescendo of their main point. An INFJ will start off by overseeing millions of related ideas from a bird's eye view and then the underlying motif will show itself eventually. Why? Well, because a bird needs to land somewhere. When you listen to an INFJ speak, you're going to be overwhelmed by their sheer intensity because they'll give you so much at once. But once you get their point, you'll also get a vague sense of what they were trying to get at. You'll be wondering to yourself, how the hell did you go from agriculture to cow farms to manufacturing of aluminum foil to Latin America to wildfires? If you wanted a super burrito, you could have just told me. Confusion number three. Both the ISFJ and the INFJ will have extroverted feeling, but they will portray them in a different manner. This is because their extroverted feeling will be tied to their other extroverted function. Uh, for the ISFJ, that's any. For the INFJ, that's SE. If you want to see the differences in action, you'll want to somehow put these two in a group setting, or at least put these two in a conversation in a somewhat crowded area. Because INFJs will be super focused and intense on a one-on-one -on -one conversation because of the nature of SE, they will tend to have a hard time adjusting their ideas to consider the other people in a group who themselves have ideas and whose ideas will potentially differ from the INFJ. I hear people say that INFJs will be so into their minds that they will sometimes bump into things or be unaware of their surroundings in general, and uh, I think you can apply that to their social settings as well. Not all the time, but very seldom. I would go so far as to say that if they are really into the conversation, INFJs will be a little bit oblivious to the social atmosphere around them. Enter the ISFJ. The ISFJ will actually figure out how to tailor their ideas to accommodate for everyone in the same group. If their any is really polished and developed, they would be able to adjust their perspective in real time to engage with other people's ideas without having to sacrifice the core of their own. They would actually be the ones who will likely help the INFJ become aware of what other people might be thinking, but usually when they are in a conversation in a crowded area, ISFJs will actually tend to have a little bit of anxiety. If their NE is underdeveloped, they would actually be paranoid that other people are listening to their conversation. <laughs> And uh, back when I thought I was an INFJ, I was hanging out with an INFJ friend of mine. She was a super cool person, but one time when we spoke, I was a little bit anxious about the topic that she was talking about. And then I eventually told her like, hey, I love what you're talking about. And I really feel the passion, homegirl. But we're in a Vietnamese restaurant and I'm enjoying a bowl of pho. So I will have to politely refrain from listening to your praise of blue toilet water just for now. And she was like, oh, whoops, sorry. Sometimes I can get a little carried away with my thoughts. Um, do you like pupusas? Confusion number four. Both the INFJ and the ISFJ are slow learners, but once they understand a concept, they really understand a concept. If you're an INFJ, you'll take in a couple of new concepts and then you'll just let it develop in the back of your mind while you do something else entirely. 
And then one day, you know, let's say that you're doing the dishes, and then all of a sudden you drop a plate because you have an epiphany, and then you finally understand the concept really well. The trouble is that you're not sure how you came to understand it so well, and now you have a chipped plate in the sink. Nonetheless, it's really adorable and charming. If you are an ISFJ, you would consciously figure out how to relate this new thing to everything else you've learned in the past. And then once you understand the concept, and the step-by-step -step progression from what you already know to what you know now, then you discover a whole bunch of unique insights that go beyond that new concept. The trouble is that you are the only one who knows this, and it rarely occurs to you to tell everybody else about it. This is understandable, and I'll explain this in a future video. Confusion number five. Both the INFJ and the ISFJ are pretty good at handling chaos and uncertainty. The difference is how the two types approach this. INFJs are pretty carefree about chaos. If they were to plan out their day or their week and they go and execute on that plan and then something pops up, they're more likely to be like, eh, fuck it, and then just roll with it. They will reschedule everything else in real time and then they'll get to everything else on their list. Eventually, ISFJs will anticipate chaos. If they suspect that something will pop up in their week, they will adjust their schedule to allow more flexibility, but they will make sure to get back to the schedule ASAP. They would be like, Oh my god, if Tom and Becky and Salvador come over, I know I'm gonna slog through 7 hours of Mario Party, and too many shots of tequila, and 12 pizza slices, and I don't even drink. I'm gonna have to have like 2 days to myself to just get over that trauma. And then I'm going to have to get back to my video editing, and then I'm going to have to close myself off for like a month. Confusion number six. Both types will have humanitarian drives, but they will have different sources of motivation to fulfill them. With this point, I'm going to have to admit I'm actually just throwing some darts out there, uh, because I haven't heard this from anyone else. And also, this idea is going to be different from what everybody else says, but when an ISFJ thinks about the past, and they look through memories, and when they go through periods of nostalgia, not saying that it actually happens as often as people think it does, but when it happens, the experience is actually intense, and the visions of their past will have some sort of cinematic quality to them. For the ISFJ, if you reorient this cinematic nostalgia to the future, and you combine that with your hopes and dreams, then your normal meticulous and statistical attitude to the future will be replaced by a sense of wonder. It's like watching a French film that hasn't been released to the public yet. My guess is that this is your source of motivation. As for the INFJ, you will hold a vast collection of related ideas, and then to make up for the vague details, you will make educated guesses and your thoughts will have a futuristic twang to them. This is the fleeting feeling of observing a landscape from a bird's eye view that I mentioned earlier. My guess is that if you reorient that view to your past and reflect upon life, then you will see another beautiful landscape, but it will represent everything you've done right and everything that you've learned. This will be some sort of grandiose reminder that you are capable of pulling off way more than you lead yourself to believe. And my guess is that this will be your source of motivation. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's it. Um, if after all this you're still confused because you tend to resonate with both, then uh, I don't know what to do for you, to be honest. <laughs> but I will wish that you have a great day, and that you sort of work it out on your own. And uh, in the meantime, I'll pray that you get it, and I will be rooting for you every step of the way. Alright, I'll see you all next time.